scholars uh, tell us, and I, when I say scholars, I'm talking about evangelical scholars, people who believe the Bible says what it means, means what it says, when rightly divided. In other words, the reason I always add that, when rightly divided, if you're reading some statement in the Old Testament, uh, you have to remember if uh, that statement was made under another covenant than the one we're in now. So um, you have to understand um, when it was said and under what uh, time and history and how God was dealing with people when it was said. Um, but when rightly divided, the word means exactly what it says and says exactly what it means. We don't have to try to figure it out. We need to believe it. So, last Wednesday evening, I talked about the genuine rest God provides his people with. And let me go through that, and I'm going to try not to spend much time on it, because then I don't have enough time for this week's lesson. But I, I get so excited about the scripture that when I want to speed through things, I just can't find the speed, uh, the foot pedal to push it down. Because uh, when I go through them, I thought maybe they didn't catch it the first time. Maybe I need to explain it some more. But anyway, uh, verses 1 to 11 is what we covered last Wednesday. And. Uh, Paul is picking up a theme he began in chapter 3. He said, let us, we, we believers in other words, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of. Now the rest that he's talking about in the Old Testament, where he's quoting from the Old Testament scriptures, is the rest that God promised his people. Yet, even though God promised his people the promised land, every adult who left the land of Egypt, every adult male at least, who left the land of Egypt except for Joshua and Caleb, who gave a positive report when they went into the land of Canaan. The other ten spies gave a negative report, and, and uh, Israel as a whole believed the ten, and that's why they were sentenced to wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Every ad adult male, 20 and older, who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. And so he's talking about why and how God swore that they would not enter into his rest. So let's read on. Now he's talking about they were promised one thing. We have a different economy. And unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So he's saying we have a gospel message. And the word gospel means good news. They had a different gospel message, but it was still a good news message. I provided this wonderful land for you. But the good news message they had, many did not receive it because when push came to shove, they doubted. They didn't believe God, and so they died in the wilderness, all right? So, verse four. For he spake a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, talking about the Genesis account, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. For six days, he was doing things on the planet. The seventh day, he had finished his work and he rested. So, verse five, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must, must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So Paul's demonstrating to his readers that the rest that God prepared for the Israelites was different than the rest he's provided for himself on the seventh day, obviously. How? When God said, if they shall enter into my rest, he spoke of a different rest than the one he entered into. Again, he entered into a rest of ceasing from his own works. The Israelites 
didn't cease from their own works when they entered the promised land. They tilled their gardens, they uh, took care of their livestock, they planted their crops. Uh, it was a different kind of rest. It was a rest where God had provided something of their own, different than the bondage they had in Egypt. But it was different than the rest of God. And that becomes important as we go on. Verse 7. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, in other words, saying in a psalm of David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Now, don't be confused by what I just read to you. You get out your uh, newer translations. It does not, it is not telling us if Jesus has given them rest. It's saying if Joshua. Joshua and Jesus are the same Hebrew and Greek word. But the New Testament is written in Greek, so we read Jesus. The Old Testament in Hebrew, we read Joshua. So Joshua, that's why the uh, here when it's rendering from the old to the new, the King James translators rendered Joshua Jesus. But it's talking about Joshua here. Joshua, after Moses had disobeyed God and God took him up in the mountain and showed him the promised land, Joshua led the children of Israel across Jordan into the promised land. So what he's saying is talking about Joshua. When, so again, in the Greek it said but for Jesus, but what it's talking about there, same name, if Joshua had given them rest, then would not, or then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. So here's what he's getting at. In the Psalms, David writes, there's a, there's a day of rest coming. What well, centuries after Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land? So David is not talking about the same rest that we read about in the book of Genesis and the beginning of the book of Galatians. Well, I should say no. Uh, let me catch my, gather my thoughts here. Actually beginning with the book of uh, Judges. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Joshua, dealing with the book of Joshua, and then Judges, uh, dealing with the book of Joshua, you read the story of how God chose Joshua to replace Moses, and he led the people into the promised land. Centuries later, David writes about another rest. So Paul the Apostle seizes upon that and said, what rest is David talking about? So he said, there remains, in verse 9, therefore a rest to the people of God. So Paul's telling us, Paul is writing centuries after David. And he's saying that the rest that David spoke of still hasn't been granted. It remains for the people of God, and when Paul says people of God, he's talking about Christians. So there's a rest for Christians that remains. Verse 10, for he that entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. So God simply ceased from doing a work that was already completed in the previous six days. How many of you have ever worked six day weeks right. yeah. and took a day off after that? So whatever you did that day off, brother in Daryl's case, you spent hours at the bowling alley, uh, whatever it might have been, that was a day of rest. Because come the next day, he was going to climb back into a semi and go back to work. So his Sabbath day, and. The Sabbath of the Jews was Saturday, the last day of the week. But the Sabbath, if you work, we're not Jews. Most, I, I'm not. I don't know if any of you have Jewish blood in you or not. But um, let's say your work week is Tuesday to Monday. 
I mean Wednesday to Monday, six days. Then Tuesday's your Sabbath. Not a re religious Sabbath like Saturday was to the Jew, but it's your day of rest. Are you following me? And so he's, Paul is saying here that uh, David said there's a different rest. The rest Joshua led his people into was nothing like the rest God entered into after six days of creation. What's the difference? Their rest was the promised land. God's rest, by the way, when they went into the promised land, they had to conquer it. Not a lot of rest there. God's rest was ceasing from his own works. There is a rest that remains for the children of God that is like the rest of God. What rest? Where we cease from our own works. And I'm going to show you in today's lesson why this is so important to wrap your brain around. Where we cease from our own works. One of the biggest jobs a Christian has is to quit working to win God's approval. Jesus won God's approval for you. God approves of you because of what Jesus did, not because of anything you've done. The hardest thing, again, Martin Luther said when he was uh, in his commentary on the book of Galatians, when he was com commenting on the first verse of chapter 5, he in essence said, the problem with people is it's easier to wrap the brain, the brain around legalism than faith. Because everything, now he didn't say this, I'm adding my comment. Everything we do in this life, we try to win someone's favor. I wanted to marry that girl, I had to win her favor. I'm going to tell you, you get a job and you want that job to go easy, you try to win your boss's favor. When you're growing up in a house, especially around Christmas. You're trying to win mom and dad's favor, right? Everything, you join the army and go to boot camp. You're trying to win that drill sergeant's favor. Everything in this world operates on our performance, except the gospel. Who gets the promotions at work? the ones who impress the boss, who win the boss's favor. Barb's older sister got graduation pictures. Got what else, did she get a ring or something? Um, uh, had a graduation party, did she? Barb had neither. Um, same mother. But for some reason, her older sister, maybe because they were their oldest child, won mom's favor. And we don't always understand. We can work really hard and think we're doing a greater job than someone else, but the other person won the boss's favor. And uh, so we go through life trying to perform for people. To check that at the door when you get into your Christian walk is harder than it sounds. So Martin Luther in his comments on Galatians 5.1 said that legalism is bound up in the heart of man and it's hard to drag it out of there. We just feel like we have to perform for God. We're going to try to show you today why you can't do that. All right, let's drop on down. Well, let's read verses 10 and 11 and then drop to the lesson today's lesson. He that entereth into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. All right, verse 11. Let us labor. This is an interesting verse. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Let any man fall after the same example of unbelief, referring back to the Israelites in the wilderness. So he said, God's got a place of rest for us. And we enter into that rest the way Joshua and Caleb entered into their rest. 
by believing the report of God. God said, I'm going to give you that land. Twelve spies, one from each tribe, go over and spy on it. Only two come back with a positive report, Joshua and Caleb. So 40 years later, when everybody else, all their young men that were their age, when they went over, are dead. Joshua and Caleb are 40 years older. Joshua is now the new Moses. He's directing the folk. But old Caleb comes up to Joshua one day when he's dividing the land and says, don't forget me. He said, I'm as strong as I was 40 years ago. And Joshua gave him a nice hunk of land. They believed what God said against whelming evidence that it appeared to be wrong. These people were much larger than them. They had walled cities. It seemed impossible that they could take that land. Yet, when they go over to Jericho, God had this brilliant plan. I mean, the wisdom of God. How can you beat that? God said, Joshua, tell them all to march around the city one time today. So they all marched around the city, the entire group of Israelites, and they went back to their camp. Got up next day and said, tell them to march around it again. For six days, they got up and marched around that city. Seventh day, they wake up and God said, Joshua, tell them to march around it seven times today. It was a rather large city, that's a long walk. Seven times. And at the end of the seventh time, have them blow, uh, blow the trumpet, and when the Israelites hear the trumpet, I want every last one of them to shout. And when they obeyed God that seventh day, the walls fell flat. Brilliant plan. I mean, that would work for any general today, right? Just march around the enemy and shout at the end of the seventh time on the seventh day. I'm sure they'll run away scared. But it worked that day because God was in it. And they believed God. Now, verse 12. We need to enter into his rest. Last week, there is a genuine, genuine rest God has for us where we see from our own works. That's what it said uh, in verse 10 of last week's lesson. We need to enter his rest. It is necessary, and I'm going to show you why. Verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The New Living Translation renders verse 12 this way. For the Word of God is full of living power. It is sharper than the sharpest knife, cutting deep into our innermost thoughts and desires. It exposes us for what we really are. Regarding, in the King James, it uses the word marrow. According to dictionary.com, here's what marrow means. As far as the anatomy is concerned, it's a soft, fatty. Now, Daryl, you probably know this, I'm guessing. Uh, he's into learning how to be healthier. Uh, it's a soft, fatty, vascular tissue in the interior cavities of bones that is a major site of blood cell production. So when he said he can divide asunder the joints in the marrow, marrow, he's in essence saying these things are inside the bones. And the joints are bones. And inside those bones is marrow. And God's word is so amazing. To figure, figuratively speak, it divides between the marrow inside the bone and the bone itself. Now, we'll try to make sense of that for you here as we go on. Uh, there's a couple other examples of Merrill there in dictionary.com used in figures of speech. So what's his point? What's Paul's point here? What God says happens. The Word of God is quick and powerful. 
what God said happens. Nothing protects us from His Word. The people who doubted God died in the wilderness. There is no hiding from the Word of God. Now this sounds heavy, but it's about to get exciting. You can't hide from God's Word. You can't protect yourself from it. God's Word is, is creative, therefore what He says will always happen. If God opens his mouth and said something, it's going to happen. He's creator God, and his words create. All right, so if he says, it will always happen. He said that the unbelieving Israelites would not enter into his rest, the promised land, and they didn't. But also, God's word separates everything in order to see the truth. His word, or his person, sees deep into who we are. He sees our every thought and deeper yet. He sees the intentions <coughs> behind those thoughts. Listen to what it said again. He's the discerner, the end of verse 12 in the King James, he's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He doesn't only know what you're thinking, he knows why you're thinking it. All right? He sees every thought. Now put that page over if you would. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Any creature. And that certainly includes all mankind. There is neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all, now listen to the, the rest of this verse. Buckle up. This, this should be really heavy. For all things are naked and opened onto the eyes of him, who's the him, with whom we have to do. The God we serve. We are as naked as a newborn baby. He sees everything about us. He sees more than the doctor sees in that newborn baby. The doctor pulls out a baby and hopes it's healthy. God looks at that baby and knows its entire future. Every human being is an open book before God. Most of us occasionally do, comparatively speaking, some good things. Now, I worded that very carefully. Most of us do, comparatively speaking, when we compare ourselves to others, some good things. When God looks at us and compares our actions to his holiness, here's what he said in the Old Testament, and Paul repeats in Romans chapter 3. This is God's commentary about you and me. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. On our best days, when we're doing really nice stuff, God sees deep inside of us and knows why we're doing that nice stuff. Sometimes we're doing that nice stuff to get recognized. Some churches love the well-off families to give big offerings. So if you give a thousand dollars or ten thousand, they got your name printed somewhere on a wall on a brick somewhere in the church. Now when you got that kind of money to blow and you get that kind of money and your main reason is you want your name on that wall, everybody says, what a good thing he did. He gave ten thousand dollars. 
God saw the intention, not just the action. Sometimes we forgive people being legalistically inclined as we are, as Martin Luther said. We forgive people to win God's favor. We're ever performing. It was a good thing we did. We told somebody we, uh, we forgive you. But the intentions were bad. My point is, why do we need to discover and enter into this rest? Because we are serving a God who doesn't miss one thing about us. She knows everything. Absolutely everything. All right? He knows your best days. He knows your worst days. So he said... We're serving a God who sees through every part of who we are. In verse 13. Now he switches gears a little bit in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, talking about Jesus, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, our profession of faith. We put our faith in Jesus Christ, right? So the author is telling us that the work of salvation is already completed. The author of our salvation, our great high priest, has already passed into heaven where he, he is currently bending the ear of his Father on our behalf, making intercession for us according to Romans 8, 34. Jesus, I'm going to tell you how radically God's in love with you. He's not going to let you mess up this trip to heaven. He's taken one third of the Godhead when you got saved and put it inside of you. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in. And in Romans 8, 26 and 7, do you know what the Holy Spirit's job is inside of you? To pray for those things you don't know how to pray for. Now why is that important? We're on a journey to get from here to there and to grow spiritually along the way. The problem is we don't even know how to do that because we don't know where we're at. But the Holy Spirit knows exactly where we're at. And so he prays for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. This isn't talking about tongues here. Go to 1 Corinthians 14, you'll read a lot about praying in tongues. But here he's talking about the Holy Spirit praying, not you. Not you praying in the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit inside of you praying because that verse is we know not how to pray as we ought. We don't know how to get from here to the next step of growth. So the Holy Spirit groans inside of us. And the next verse, verse 27, and that was verse 26 in Romans 8. Verse 27 says, the Father looks and he answers the Holy Spirit's prayer. Why? Because everything the Holy Spirit prays is according to the Father's will. You and I never get there in this world. We pray for all kinds of stuff that's not His will. But the Holy Spirit inside of us is interceding for us with groanings that can't be uttered. God's answering those prayers because they're all according to the will of God. So verse 28, the verse you all know, for all things work together for good, for the good of them that love God. How come? Because even though we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit's inside of us praying for us. In verse 26 and verse 27, God is answering the prayers of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. In verse 28. Beautiful story. So, there we see the... This is how much God trusts you to get yourself to heaven. He put the Holy Spirit inside of you to intercede for you. And he sat Jesus, his son, next to him to constantly ever make intercession for you. He's ever making intercession for you, the Bible says in Romans 8. So get this. 
God has zero confidence in my ability to get myself to heaven. That's right. So he put the Holy Spirit here and Jesus sitting next to him. And they're both doing the same thing, bending the ear of the Father on my behalf. Jesus is always interceding for me. I know that, I know. But we love them, don't we? I'm going to tell you, God the Spirit, God the Father, God the Son have never disagreed on anything. So if Jesus loves me, and he said, Jesus said, as my Father has loved me, in John 15, 9, even so have I loved you. If Jesus loved me, I guarantee you, the Father loves me. They've never had a disagreement. How much did Jesus love me? He loves me as much as the Father loves him. Can you wrap your brain around that? Perfection, the Father. Loving perfection, the Son. Perfection, the Son. Loving this. As much as the Father loves him. When Jesus said that, he said, continue you in my love. And that word continue is mental. M-E-N-O in the Greek. It's what the Holy Spirit does in you. He remains in you. So Jesus said, pitch your tent right there. Pitch your tent right there. Don't move. I love you as much as the Father loves me. Make that your address. That's where you live. You live in my love. And there's no firmer foundation anywhere than this. So Jesus, we now have this great high priest in verse 14. Jesus, the Son of God. So let's hold fast our profession. Now look at verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities or our weaknesses but with an all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So here's this perfect God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he walked this planet in human form, can sympathize with me. What? I'm going to tell you the kind of Christians I've met over the years. I've met some good ones, but again, comparatively speaking, we compare one to the other. When I was a young preacher, I ran, run into a lot of people, Christians seasoned, not with salt, but seasoned, been around the church for a long time. Somebody had come up forward in a revival meeting we were holding. You talked to some seasoned saint after the service. And they'd say, bless God, they keep coming up, they don't get it. He said, they I wish I, I could get this uh, exactly the way they said it, but their attitude was this. They keep coming up and praying all over again. He said, I prayed through. I prayed through. Bless God, when I got up, I was different. I prayed through, bless God. I thought you might have prayed through your cigarettes. You might have even prayed through your alcohol, but you sure didn't pray through that attitude. Shame on you. Instead of hurting, Jesus is touched with their infirmity. And some seasoned saint of God sits on a pious scene of self-righteousness and said, I prayed through. I'm not seeing that, pal. What I'm witnessing right now, that's not what I'm witnessing. Jesus walked a mile in my shoes. He dressed himself with flesh. The, even though he never sinned, he understood the enticement of sin. 
because he walked a mile in our shoes. He sympathizes with us. He understands it's one thing for God to walk this walk and never sin. It's quite another for imperfect human flesh to walk this world and never sin. He sympathizes with us. He's our high priest. He's the one that intercedes to the Father for us. And he's not saying, Dad, I don't know what I better do with Dave. He said, God, Dave's coming along. Look where he was yesterday. Took another step today. He's going to get there, Dad. All the time, the Holy Spirit talking to God this way. <laughs> Groanings that can be uttered. And God understands every groaning. God ever understands every intercession of his son. He's my high priest. The high priest of the Jews offered the animals on the altar. Jesus, and they had to do it every year because it couldn't take away sin. Hebrews will tell us that later. Jesus offered himself once for all time. The one sacrifice of sin, uh, uh, for sin forever removed my sin. This is why I got to enter into this rest where I cease from my own works. Because when I'm trusting me, when I'm trusting my works, I'm in misery all the time because I know I come up short. But when I put my trust in his work, I dare not raise my voice against what he did. It was perfect in every way. The final verse of this chapter. Let us therefore, I love the ending of this, let, let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace. Don't crawl in with your head down. Walk in boldly. Right. Walk in boldly to the throne room. Why? Because Jesus made access for me. Right. I'm not going in there on the grounds of something I've done. Nothing I've done would stand the test of the God who sees everything inside of me. I walk in there having gained access through his son whose every work was faultless. So I am invited come boldly into the throne room of God. Don't be shy. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. Why? Because you're not trying to earn your way. You have ceased from your own works. You have entered into the rest that he has for his people. Because you've ceased from your own works and embraced the works of Christ, you are welcome in the throne room of God. Thank you, Jesus. On days when we do right, on days when we do wrong, his love is just the same. His love is just as strong. Yeah. He doesn't base his love on the things we say and do. Some people are offended by this. I'm sorry. He cannot help himself. He loves me and you. What do you mean by that? He can't help. He can do all things. You know, he can never quit being who he is. He can never quit being who he is. And who he is loves me because of his son's completed work on my behalf. He can't help himself. He radically loves me, fanatically loves me, relentlessly loves me, continuously loves me, unconditionally loves me. So Jesus said, and it, or Paul writes in his final verse 16, on behalf of Jesus, let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace that we may have turned mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You know, when we're going through something, 
God doesn't want us spending 10 years repenting for stuff. Or no. Before we get around to the prayer, we need to be praying. He wants us standing. You know, the Bible said we are hidden with Christ in God. We need to stand on that platform. I don't enter into the throne room of God on the basis of anything I've done, yeah, but on the basis of what Jesus got. So we are invited to come boldly.